Your doctor has recommended that you undergo a cystoscopy, but what does that actually mean? The lower urinary tract allows your body to store and release urine. It's made up of two parts, the bladder and the urethra. Your bladder is a hollow organ that expands as it fills with urine. Because it is made of muscular tissue, it can also contract and force urine to pass out of the body through the urethra. Your urethra carries urine from the bladder to the outside of your body. Your doctor feels that it is necessary to examine the interior of the urethra and bladder to try to determine the cause of the problem that you may be having. Symptoms that may call for a routine cystoscopy include persistent infection of the urinary tract, bladder stones, bleeding while urinating, irritation due to polyps, or changes to the bladder caused by cancer. Cystoscopy is a simple procedure during which your doctor will insert a well-lubricated instrument called a cystoscope through your urethra and into your bladder. The cystoscope allows your doctor to visually inspect the interior of your bladder. It also allows your doctor to remove small pieces of tissue for later examination and even to crush small bladder stones should any be present. Any tissue that your doctor removes from your bladder will be sent immediately to a laboratory for analysis. Your doctor will ask the laboratory to check for any sign of cancer or other abnormality. Because cystoscopy is a diagnostic procedure, there are few alternatives to the procedure. Most likely you're feeling some anxiety about this procedure, and that is perfectly understandable. You should realize that it's natural to feel apprehensive about any kind of diagnostic or exploratory procedure, especially one that screens for cancer. In some cases, the patient will choose not to have a cystoscopy, simply out of fear. But ignoring a medical problem won't make it go away. If you're feeling anxious, try to remember that the purpose of a cystoscopy is simply to find out what is going on in your body so that if you do have a serious problem, it can be diagnosed and treated as quickly as possible. If you should decide not to allow your doctor to perform the procedure, you will be leaving yourself at risk for serious medical problems. The bottom line, trust that your doctor has recommended this procedure for your benefit. Don't be afraid to ask questions raised by this presentation and to talk openly about your concerns. On the day of your operation, you will be asked to put on a surgical gown. You may receive a sedative by mouth and an intravenous line may be put in. You will then be transferred to the operating table. Once on the table, your feet and legs will be placed in an elevated position with your knees apart. You will be asked to urinate so the amount of urine remaining in the bladder can be measured. A nurse will then shave your pubic area and swab the opening of the urethra with an antiseptic solution. A well lubricated cystoscope is gently inserted into the urethra and slowly guided inward. Once the cystoscope is inside the bladder, your doctor will inject a small amount of water through the cystoscope and into the bladder. The water serves to expand the bladder, helping your doctor to better examine the interior. It also helps by washing away any blood or remaining urine. You may feel a sense of fullness as though you need to urinate. You'll be encouraged to relax and not to try to retain the water in your bladder. As the team completes the inspection, they'll be looking for suspicious tissues. If they find bladder stones, your doctor may try to crush these so that they can pass out of the bladder during normal urination. If the team finds a suspicious growth, they will use a special grasping tool to take a sample of the tissue in order to send it to a laboratory for analysis. 
When the inspection is complete, your doctor will remove the cystoscope and you'll be asked to empty your bladder. Your doctor will probably ask you to wear a temporary Foley catheter. A Foley catheter is a narrow tube inserted through the urethra and into your bladder. The catheter is connected to a bag that is attached to your leg by a strap. While the Foley catheter is in place, urine will pass from your bladder into the bag. You will not need to urinate into a toilet. The nurse will show you how to change the bag when it's full. An appointment will be made for you to return to the doctor's office in a couple of days to have the catheter removed. As soon as the anesthesia wears off and you feel comfortable, you'll be allowed to leave. Most patients experience at least some pain following surgery. But if properly handled, it shouldn't present any serious problems. Pain used to be regarded as an unavoidable side effect of surgery, but today, pain can be managed with great effectiveness. And as the patient, you have an important role to play. Before surgery, be sure to ask the medical staff about the type and duration of pain normally associated with your surgery. Find out in advance about your pain management options. Work with the staff to develop a pain management plan. Discuss your options. There are alternatives to drugs that can lessen your need for pain medication. Ask your doctor for help in finding a pain management class. Many of these workshops teach helpful relaxation techniques, positive thinking, and nerve stimulation exercises. Following surgery, make sure to let your nurse know right away how you're feeling and whether or not you are in any pain. Be specific and help them to measure your discomfort. If you're having trouble expressing yourself, try to rank what you're feeling on a scale from 1 to 10. Never be shy about asking for help. If you experience pain that just won't go away, report it to the nurse. Pain is an important indicator that helps you and your medical staff understand your body's healing process. Cystoscopy only rarely leads to complications. Unlikely but possible complications include excessive bleeding, damage to the urethra, damage to the bladder, or infection of the urinary tract. At home, you should be able to resume normal activity as you feel able. Germs are present always on your hands, and they can be transferred to other parts of your own body, to the family member for whom you're caring, your patient, and to any clean object you touch. By washing your hands correctly, you remove germs from your hands. Hand washing is the single most important way you can prevent infection from occurring and prevent the spread of infection. You must carefully wash and dry your hands before and after each time you care for your family member, your patient, before and after you handle your patient and your own food and drink, before and after you manipulate any contact lenses, before you apply and after you remove gloves, after you use the toilet, after you cough, sneeze, or blow your nose, after contact with anything that could be soiled or have germs on it. After you pick up any object from the floor. Hand washing takes a minimum of 10 to 15 seconds, longer if your hands are soiled. The longer you wash, the more germs are removed. 
The friction generated by rubbing your hands together removes the germs from your skin and running water can then wash them away. Every time you wash your hands, take your time and don't rush. Do the hand washing carefully and thoroughly. Use liquid soap from a dispenser. Bar soap holds germs on its surface. Make sure you have paper towels and a waste receptacle nearby. Remove all jewelry from your hand except a wedding band and push your watch and sleeves up away from your hands. Turn on warm water. Point your fingers down to prevent water running onto your arms and wet your hands. Apply soap from the dispenser. Point your fingers down and rub your hands vigorously together in a circular motion. Start counting seconds at this point. Intertwine your fingers to clean all surfaces of the fingers. Rub your fingernails against the palm of the other hand to get soap under the tips of the nails. If your nails are soiled, clean under them with an orange stick or brush. Keep your hands down and continue to rub them together in a circular motion until the end of your count for 15 seconds. Keep your hands down and rinse them from the wrist to fingertips. Pick up a clean paper towel and turn off the water, still keeping your hands pointed down. Discard the paper towel into the waste receptacle. Pick up another clean paper towel and carefully and completely dry your hands. Discard the paper towel into a waste receptacle. The key points to remember are that friction is critical for removing germs and the friction should be applied for at least 15 seconds. Always keep your fingers pointed down and turn off the water with a paper towel. Your correct use of disposable non-sterile gloves helps prevent the spread of infection and protects both you, the caregiver, and the person receiving care, your patient. The gloves used most often are made of latex, are powder-free, and are easy to put on and take off. They are used once only and then discarded. Gloves are not worn all the time in giving care. Touching your patient with bare hands shows love and respect, sends a message of caring and acceptance, and provides comfort. Gloves should always be worn if contact is likely to occur with blood, body fluids, excretions such as urine or feces, mucous membranes such as in the mouth or genitalia, or non-intact skin. Before you put gloves on, carefully wash and dry your hands. Pull a glove out of the box with one hand and slide it onto your other hand. With your gloved hand, pull another glove out of the box and slide it onto your bare hand. Interlace your fingers to make the gloves fit more smoothly and comfortably. You should remove your gloves immediately when the patient care procedure is complete, if the gloves are heavily soiled, if a glove is torn, 
after you have touched your patient's secretions or excretions, before touching another part of the body, before touching any clean surface or object. When you remove your gloves, your intent is to avoid touching the contaminated surfaces of the gloves with your bare hands. To take off your gloves, firmly grip one glove at the base of the palm and pull it off inside out. Keep holding it in the palm of your gloved hand. Slip your bare fingers under the wrist of the remaining glove without touching its surface. Push the glove down and off with the first glove tucked inside of it. One glove is now inside the other and both are inside out. Drop the bundle of gloves into a sealable plastic storage bag and seal it tightly. Drop the sealed bag into the trash. Carefully wash and dry your hands. While you were in the hospital, you received instructions on how to insert a catheter into your own bladder and practice the procedure until you could do it on your own. Before you self-catheterize at home, you will need to assemble the following equipment. Urine collecting hat, warm soapy water in a basin, clean washcloth, catheter, lubricant, clean hand towel, resealable plastic bag. Void into the hat. Measure the amount of urine and record it in the voided volume column on your record sheet. Carefully wash and dry your hands. For a female, lubricate the catheter for a distance of approximately 2 inches from the tip. The female should self-catheterize when sitting on the toilet. Soak the washcloth in warm soapy water and wring it partly dry. Separate the thighs wide apart. With one hand, separate the labia. With the other hand, Use the washcloth to clean the vulva from front to back in a single stroke. Alternately, an antibacterial wipe may be used, wiping once from front to back. Still holding the labia apart, grasp the lubricated catheter with the other hand, three to four inches from the tip. Insert the catheter slowly and gently into the urethra. Thread the catheter into the bladder a distance of two to three inches. When the catheter is in the bladder, urine will drain out. Collect the urine into the hat. When the flow of urine stops, gently remove the catheter. Wash the catheter with soap and water, dry it with a clean towel, and store it in a resealable plastic bag. The catheter may be reused for one to two months. Measure the amount of urine in the hat and note the volume in the post-void residual column of your record. Discard the urine into the toilet and wash out the hat. Wash and dry your hands. During the insertion, never force the catheter. If you meet resistance and cannot advance the catheter, remove the catheter and notify your health care provider. Always measure the amount of urine in the hat and write it down in the post-void residual column of your output record.
The equipment you will need to assemble includes two pair of clean disposable gloves, cleansing solution, small gauze pads for cleaning, large gauze pads for dressing the wound, adhesive tape, a large sealable plastic bag. Carefully wash and dry your hands. Put on your gloves. The first step is to remove the old dressing. Loosen the edges of the tape and peel the tapes off the skin by pulling them towards the wound, keeping the skin taut with the other hand. Lift the tapes and the dressing off together. Note any odor or color of any drainage on the dressing. Discard the dressing and tapes into the plastic bag. If the dressing sticks to the wound, pour a little cleansing solution onto the dressing and let it sit for a minute. Gently pull the dressing off keeping the skin taut above the wound. Look carefully at the wound. Any of the following should be reported immediately to your doctor or nurse. Redness of the wound or surrounding skin, drainage from the wound, particularly if it's yellow and smells, any bleeding, swelling of the skin around the wound, separation of the edges of the sutured wound or maceration, a waterlogged appearance of the edges of the wound. Pour some cleansing solution onto a small gauze pad. Squeeze out the surplus solution and with one stroke clean the wound from top to bottom. Discard the gauze pad into the plastic bag. Using a fresh gauze pad with cleansing solution for each stroke Work away from the wound to clean the skin for about three inches from the wound on either side. Stroke from top to bottom and discard each gauze pad into the plastic bag. Remove your gloves and discard them into the plastic bag. Wash and dry your hands. Open the package with a large gauze dressing. Put on clean gloves. Pick up the gauze dressing, holding it only at two diagonally opposite corners. Center the gauze pad over the wound and place it on the wound. Tape the dressing securely in place. Remove your gloves and discard them into the plastic bag. Seal the bag securely and discard it into the trash. Wash and dry your hands. If your skin is sensitive to the adhesive on the tape, hypoallergenic tape can be bought at your surgical supply store, or bandages or binders can be used to hold the dressing in place. Consult with your doctor or nurse. urinary drainage system consists of a catheter inserted into the urinary bladder and connected via tubing to a drainage bag. The catheter is retained in the bladder by an inflated balloon. The drainage of urine is totally dependent on gravity. Therefore, tubing and the drainage bag to collect urine must always be below the level of the bladder. 
As a caregiver, your responsibilities to a patient with a closed urinary drainage system are to ensure that the patient drinks at least eight ounces of fluid daily, preferably water and juice, to ensure that the catheter and tubes are in a good position and open to allow urine to flow freely into the drainage bag, and to keep the body opening where the catheter enters the patient clean and free from secretions. Ensure that the catheter and drainage tube are connected and that there is sufficient slack in the tube between the body and the thigh to allow the patient to move the thigh without pulling on the catheter. The drainage tube should be attached to the patient's leg by a tie or clip. The drainage bag can be attached to the bed frame, should never touch the floor, and should always be kept below the level of the patient's bladder. The drainage bag should be emptied at least daily, more often if it fills, in order to prevent infection in the system, reduce odors, and keep the system open and flowing. To empty the drainage bag, the following steps should always be followed. Carefully wash and then dry your hands with a paper towel. On a tray covered with clean paper towels, assemble the following equipment. A large plastic or glass container, a large plastic sealable storage bag, disposable gloves, alcohol wipes, paper towels and place the tray on a stable surface adjacent to the bed. Carefully wash your hands. Dry them with a paper towel. Discard the paper towel into a wastebasket. Put on your disposable gloves. If you are cleaning your own catheter, gloves are not essential. Place the container under the drainage bag. Remove the drain from its holder. Point it into the container and release the clamp on the drain to allow the urine to flow into the container. Do not allow the drain to touch the container or anything else. When the drainage bag is empty, close the drain, wipe the end of the drain with an alcohol wipe, and replace the drain in its holder at the base of the drainage bag. Discard the alcohol wipe into the plastic storage bag. Check that the catheter and tubes are in place. Take the equipment tray and the container of urine into the bathroom. If your doctor or nurse has asked you to record the amount of urine, measure and make a note of it now. Discard the urine down the toilet and clean the container with liquid soap and water. Remove the gloves and discard them into the plastic storage bag. Seal the bag and put it into the trash. Wash and dry your hands. Discard the paper towel into the trash. Once each day, or according to your doctor's instructions, you will need to clean the urethral metis, the opening where the catheter enters the body. The drainage bag should be emptied every six to eight hours, more often if it fills, in order to prevent infection in the system, reduce odors, and keep the system open and flowing. To empty the drainage bag, the following steps should always be followed. Carefully wash and then dry your hands with a paper towel. Discard the towel into a plastic lined wastebasket. On a tray covered with clean paper towels, assemble the following equipment. A large plastic or glass container, a large plastic sealable storage bag, disposable gloves, paper towels. Place the tray on a stable surface adjacent to the bed. 
Carefully wash your hands. Dry them with a paper towel. Discard the paper towel into the wastebasket. Put on the disposable gloves. If you are emptying your own bag, there is no need to use gloves. Place the container under the drainage bag. Remove the drain from its holder. Point it into the container and release the clamp on the drain to allow the urine to flow into the container. Do not allow the drain to touch the container or anything else. When the drainage bag is empty, close the drain. Replace the drain and its holder at the base of the drainage bag. Check that the catheter and tubes are in place. Take the equipment tray and the container of urine into the bathroom. If your doctor or nurse has asked you to record the amount of urine, measure and make a note of it now. Discard the urine down the toilet and clean the container with liquid soap and water. Dry it thoroughly with a paper towel and discard the paper towel into the trash. Remove your gloves and discard them into the plastic storage bag. Seal the bag and put it into the trash. Wash and dry your hands. Discard the paper towel into the trash. Some patients are able to wear a leg bag during the day to allow them to walk about. The larger drainage bag is disconnected from the catheter in order to attach the leg bag. The leg bag is secured to the front of the thigh or lower leg. After it's been disconnected from the catheter, the larger drainage bag can be unhooked from the bed frame, carried into the bathroom, and emptied directly into a measuring device or the toilet. The procedure to replace a bedside drainage with a leg bag to enable the patient to move about is as follows. The equipment you will need to assemble includes the leg bag, alcohol wipes, a cap for the drainage tube, paper towels, disposable gloves, and a sealable plastic bag. Take the equipment on the tray to the bedside. Wash and dry your hands. If you are doing this procedure for another person, put on disposable gloves. Place a paper towel under the connection of the catheter to the drainage tube. Disconnect the catheter from the drainage tubing. Wipe the end of the drainage tubing with an alcohol wipe and discard it into the plastic bag. Cap the end of the drainage tube and place it carefully on the bed so that it does not fall on the floor. Remove the cap from the end of the leg bag connector. Connect the leg bag to the catheter. Strap the bag to the outside or front of the thigh or lower leg so that there is no tension on the catheter connection. Check that the label top on the leg bag is at the top. Discard the paper towel into the plastic bag. Reverse the procedure when the patient returns to bed. Take this opportunity to empty the bedside drainage bag into the toilet and wash and rinse the bag before returning it to the bedside. Remove your gloves, discard them into the plastic bag, seal the bag and discard it into the trash. Wash and carefully dry your hands.
The leg bag will need to be emptied every two to three hours. Following surgery, you may have a suprapubic catheter or be on a program of intermittent self-catheterization as your bladder recovers from the effects of surgery. To help your bladder heal, you will need to increase the time between self-catheterization or unplugging the suprapubic catheter until there is no need for a catheter. To know the time intervals needed between catheterization or removing the plug, you need to keep a record of the amount of urine you are producing when you void and when you catheterize or unplug. You should try to void every two to three hours and immediately before you self-catheterize or remove the plug. Void into the hat placed into the toilet and measure the amount of urine in the hat. This amount is called the voided volume. Write this amount on your record sheet every time you void. When you self-catheterize or unplug, measure the urine that empties from the catheter. This amount is called the post-void residual, or PVR, and is written down on your output record sheet in the PVR column. Look at your output record sheet. Each entry on the record will have a date, time, and the amount of urine in either the voided volume column or the post-void column. Your output record can be taped to the back of the bathroom door to keep it handy. The basic guidelines for the timing of self-catheterization or plug removal during bladder retraining are throughout the day void as often as you like at least every two hours. Measure each void in the hat. Write the amount in the voided volume column of your output record. Begin by self-catheterizing or unplugging the suprapubic catheter every four hours. Immediately before catheterizing or unplugging, void into the hat, measure the volume and write it in the voided volume VV column of your output record. When you self-catheterize or remove the plug, save and measure the urine that comes out of the catheter and write the amount in the post-void residual, PVR column, of your output record. If your post-void residual urine, PVR, is less than 150 cc's, you can increase your time intervals between catheterizations or plug removal by two hours, say from four to six or six to eight hours. If your post-void residual urine, PVR, is between 150 and 250 cc's, you should keep the time interval between catheterizations or plug removal the same. If your post-void residual urine, PVR, is more than 250 cc's, you should decrease the time interval by two hours. Try not to self-catheterize or remove the suprapubic catheter plug more often than every four hours unless you feel uncomfortable or full. Start in the morning from where you left off the previous day. You do not need to start over each day. Keep your output record to show your health care providers. Once you are consistently at 12-hour intervals between catheterizations or plug removal, consult your health care provider who may tell you to stop the retraining process. The retraining process may take several weeks or even months. Do not get discouraged. Let's look at an example of a recording. In the morning, you wake at 8 a.m. and you could not void any urine. Point zero is recorded in the voided volume, VV column. Then you catheterize and produce 300 cc's of urine. This is recorded in the post-void residual, PVR column. 
From the basic guidelines, you know you must wait four hours until the next catheterization or plug removal, unless you are uncomfortable. You will attempt to void every two hours and record the amount you void in the voided volume VV column. At 12 noon, you void 100 cc's and record this in the voided volume VV column. The four hourly catheterization or plug removal produces 150 cc's of urine and this is recorded in the post void residual PVR column. From the basic guidelines, this means you continue with four hourly catheterizations or plug removal. At 2 p.m., you voided 90 cc's and recorded this in the VV column. At 4 p.m., you voided 150 cc's and again recorded it in the VV column. You catheterize or remove the plug and produce 100 cc's of urine, which is recorded in the PVR column. Basic guidelines tell you that the next catheterization or plug removal can be moved out to six hours because your PVR was below 150 cc's. During the evening, you voided at 6 p.m. and 8 p.m. and recorded these amounts in the VV column. At 10 p.m., your voided volume is 175 cc's and your PVR on catheterization or plug removal is 125 cc's. Because your PVR is again below 150 cc's, you can increase the time between catheterization or plug removal from 6 to 8 hours. When you are self-catheterizing or removing the plug every 12 hours, you must set your alarm at night so that you awake and attempt to void every 3 to 4 hours. Record each void in the VV column of your output record. The following problems or symptoms are reasons to contact your healthcare provider immediately. Little or no urine flow. Cloudy or foul smelling urine. Sand like material in the urine. Bloody urine. A red or swollen urinary opening. Difficulty inserting the catheter. Pain in the lower back or lower abdomen. Chills or temperature above 100.5 degrees.